Welcome everybody, this is an introduction to the Toshiba IK-WT14A camera. This is a really powerful camera for a very low price. This camera is a full HD camera. Uh, it supports wide dynamic range. It has day and night functionality. It includes IR illuminators, two-way audio. It also supports uh, compression mechanisms such as H.264. It is a PoE compliant camera. It is a fully adjustable uh, um, lens position, and it has automatic focus features. Um, it has all of the features that most people are looking for in a camera, and it is typically two or three hundred dollars less than competitor cameras of the same type of camera. This is what you see before you is what comes with the camera when you open it out of the box for the first time. Uh, it comes with the manual, a quick start guide. It comes with a mounting uh, alignment uh, sticker plus uh, screws uh, and drywall, drywall, drywall screws. It also includes a limited uh, warranty, which is a two-year warranty that most Toshiba cameras carry. It also has an audio video cable that can be used to plug into the audio video ports on the camera. It also supports the ability to have a coax out. The reason for this is for a handheld or wrist worn uh, video display unit that you can use in the field when adjusting the cameras. In addition, it comes with a small hex, uh, a small star screwdriver so that you can um, unscrew the uh, dome onto the camera itself. It does not include a PoE switch or cabling, but it does include the camera and its housing. When you first get the camera, after you've removed all the protective uh, wrapping, the camera will look like this. You will unscrew the screws on, onto the uh, camera and it will lift the dome off. Notice that the dome, the dome has, uh, it's not a lot of features on the dome itself. However, it does have knockouts in case you want to do a side mount. And notice the knockout is big enough to run a piece of EMT up into the camera if you needed to. You are now looking at the camera itself. Um, a couple of uh, points about the camera. It ships with a small little protective ring up here, a foam ring. You need to remove that prior to installing it. You don't want it to get loose and block the lens of the camera. As you can see, the camera has built-in IR uh, illuminators. It also has a, a light detection unit. It also has two-way audio. It also has tampering um, detection. And, uh, on, and on the back, you'll notice it has a micro SD card slot. It has audio visual out for this cable here. It has audio in for external microphones. It has your PoE based uh, PoE Ethernet port. It also has uh, external uh, inputs and outputs, digital input, digital output. It also supports powering the camera with an external power support source. The camera has an adjustable way to adjust the lens. As you can see here, by untwisting these things on the side here, you can move the lens up and down. You can also uh, you can adjust it other ways as well. So it's completely adjustable. It can be turned uh, of wide. You can turn the lens, or you can adjust it this way. So it's a complete three axis uh, um, uh, adjust adjustments can be made on the camera. Now that we're done looking at the camera, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the software. The camera comes with a CD-ROM. If you put the CD-ROM in your computer, you can run it. It must run on a Windows machine. So let's go ahead into the machine. You'll see it now. You see this thing called the Installation Wizard. You'll go ahead and double click on that Installation Wizard and run it. When the installation come up, it's going to try to detect what type of network you're on. In this case, it's detected that I'm using uh, DHCP. So I'm going to click Next and it's going to go out and try to discover the camera. It may take a few minutes to do this, but if you're on a, uh, on a slash 24 network, it won't take very long. But notice in this case, it's discovered the MAC address and IP of the camera, and it's got the correct model number. Now, you can take the opportunity now to look at the back of the camera, and you'll notice that the MAC address and serial number on the back of this camera. You can compare that to the MAC address on the camera in your uh, installation wizard to make sure it's the correct camera. You can now click on this, or you can actually double click on it, and you'll bring up the web interface. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on it now, and uh, I've now brought up the camera interface, as you can see. Very important is you'll note here 
that the uh, camera came up automatically. Now it requires Internet Explorer and a couple of other very fine points you must make. The reason it requires Internet Explorer is because it uses an ActiveX control and so Internet Explorer is required. Now when you first install this and you run um, on Internet Explorer you'll notice that uh, if I go to my Internet Options and uh, my Privacy tab uh, or no, my my um, security tab. I'm sorry. And I go to I added it to my trusted sites, and I moved my trusted sites all the way to low. Now the reason I did this is notice it says all active content can run. Basically, the ActiveX control that Toshiba provides with their camera is unsigned, which means that um, anything above low on uh, Internet Explorer's trusted zones will automatically block those unsigned active content. So it, you can either go in a custom level and remove that option or you can just set it to low. And in this case I set it to low so I could easily get it to work. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK then that. So when you first load it you'll have to accept that control and it will not work unless you have uh, unsigned ActiveX controls enabled. Uh, next thing you have to worry about is you have to F12 on your browser. You must run this in browser mode, IE9 or IE8 compatible. When I'm working with the Toshiba camera, I always set it to IE8 compatibility. Uh, and the reason I do that, by the way, that was F12 if, if you don't remember it. Um, the reason I did that is because I want to be able to use some controls in this camera. And there's a couple, uh, there's some couple of controls in the software that won't work uh, unless you're in IE9 um, or 8 compatibility. We're now looking at the camera itself. One of the first things we want to do is you want to look down here at the bottom. You'll notice a variety of controls you can do. The first one I want to mess with is the audio. Here's your mic. Uh, I can mute the mic and I can mute the audio. I'm going to mute the mic and mute the audio because you know right now I'm talking into talking very loudly in this room and if I don't have those on then basically it could it could you'll you'll hear it you'll hear it echoing but this is where you enable it mute the mic and mute the audio and by the way it does have a built-in microphone on the camera uh, and it does have a built-in um, yeah so it does have a built-in mic microphone other controls down here uh, you can um, uh, very important up here to the top. You can set it uh, right now. It's not displaying true resolution. If I hit 100%, it's actually displaying the true resolution of the camera. I have to go very, very far over here and very far down to see the full resolution of the camera. This camera is truly a uh, full HD camera, which is 1920 by 1080p. Uh, consequently, um, it's a pretty large image coming out of the camera, so you, 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 if you do it, I always view it in auto just so I can see it all shrunk down in one view. But uh, just I wanted you to understand those settings up there. Next thing you need to recognize is you can actually have multiple streams coming out of the camera, up to four, uh, and and different streams can be uh, uh, in set in different formats, and so. Um, and also I think they can be set to where one of them's uh, digitally zoomed in and so you can have different streams performing different functions. You also have your uh, pan tilt zoom features here. You can also do a manual trigger. Uh, in a minute we'll talk about triggers. You can actually force a manual trigger. Uh, and then finally down here at the bottom you can take a still picture. I can take a snapshot and so notice what just happened. I took a snapshot of that uh, of there and I could save that file if I wanted to. Um, I can also uh, zoom in, and so right now uh, I, this is my digital pan tilt zoom, and I can zoom in more or less. Uh, um, and so notice I'm digitally pan tilt zooming in right now. This is not an optical pan tilt zoom; it does not have that feature in the camera. But I'm digitally uh, pan tilt zoom. I'm digitally zooming in right now, as you can see that. I can also pause the video, and then I can start it again. I can also record the video, of course. Um, when I do that, uh, it, it's assuming, of course, that you have a recording source. Um, and so we'll talk about recording sources in a minute. All right, well, there you go. You can also run this view in full screen if you wanted to. And you can see right now I'm running the camera in full screen, uh, which is pretty nice. And hit escape to get out of full screen mode. Okay, we're now done with the basic viewer settings of the camera. Let's go ahead and take a look at the configuration settings. In the configuration settings, I, uh, notice I'm in basic mode. Uh, I'm in uh, this is what basic mode looks like. Uh, I always go to advanced mode so I can show you all of the features. 
But um, let's go. So we're in advanced mode. Just make sure you understand there's a difference between basic and advanced mode. Uh, and we are in advanced mode now. A couple of things. First off, on general settings, I can change the host name of the camera to whatever I want it to be. Um, also, look at the turn off LED indicator. Uh, looking back over here at the camera, you'll see the LED uh, indicating right here. You can actually turn that off so that people couldn't see that LED blinking up in the ceiling, for example. So I'll change that. I'll choose save. And now you'll notice that the LED disappears. It is no longer active after I turn that off. I'm going to go ahead and uh, re-enable the LED. Uh, notice that I can set my time zone. So if I was, for example, uh, I'm actually in Pacific time. So I could go ahead and change that if I wanted to. Yeah, if I could find it. All right. Um, there we go. So I'm changing uh, to Pacific time. Too bad they didn't say Pacific time. Uh, and so I can also enable daylight savings time if I wanted to. And uh, you can save it's enabled or disabled. I can also keep the current date or I can synchronize with my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and synchronize with my computer right now. Uh, you can also have it manually set the time or automatically with an NTP server. Highly recommend uh, on any camera implementation, always do an NTP server because it's very important that your camera's uh, video and your video management system be synchronized. But I'm going to leave it at synchronized with computer time because I happen to, I don't have an NTP server to use right now. All right, there we go. So uh, I've now configured those settings. Homepage layout. Nothing real fancy here other than the ability to customize. Uh, I think customize really nice because I can, you can provide your own logo on here rather than Toshiba's logo, which might be very uh, a good option for those of you who are trying to brand your solution to the customer. You can also put a website up here so that when they click on the logo in the upper left hand corner, it'll actually go to your website instead of Toshiba's. Uh, and, and there you go. You can also disable or enable that trigger button that I showed you on the front. Uh, there's also a theme options. You can change colors of the theme. Let's say you wanted to match more of your solution or your color, uh, uh, your logo or, or whatever. Maybe you have it embedded in an application and you want to use those colors. You can do that up here. Anyway, that's just kind of fun. Under logs, um, you can see logs of, of you know, it's been rebooted, restarted, time's been changed. You can also enable remote log features and have it uh, send logs to an IP address, or put, so kind of like a syslog function. You can also see who accessed it and when. Uh, very important is you can um, set user accounts on this, I'll show you later, and you can track who did what on the camera. If you go to parameters, uh, there are some customized parameters that can be embedded in the camera. This is usually something you do with uh, technical support, but you can actually have specified parameters be put in the camera. And this gives you kind of a text output. Uh, one thing that's nice is you can copy uh, that text output. So you can see, you can copy and paste it into Notepad or whatever, so you can know exactly what the settings were on the camera. If you go to the maintenance tab, here's where you upload firmware. If you go to Toshiba's website, I'm going to go ahead and bring Toshiba's website up over here for you, and you go to the support and go to downloads, you can actually search for the model of camera and download the latest firmware. When you do that, you can upgrade the firmware here right in place. You can reboot the camera right from here. You can also restore all the settings. A very nice feature is to restore it except for these. The reason why you might want to do that is I don't want the camera to reboot and forget its IP address because I went through the trouble of setting it. So you can actually restore factory defaults except for the network IP. You can also back up your configure, uh, configuration file uh, by exporting it here. And you can do a server status report. Um, you might want to give these uh, technical support. We'll sometimes ask you for them if there's ever an issue. Um, and you can up upload those type of, you can upload configuration file as well. So you can back up the configuration and then you can also upload it. Okay, that's, uh, those are those details. If you click on security, you can create user accounts. Here's where you set your root password. Right now it has no password, so I was able to get into the camera right away with no password. Very important to set a, set a camera password that's uh, unique and that nobody uh, other than people that should be accessing the cameras have. Here's where you can enable or disable the ability for people to manage the digital uh, output and PTZ controls on the viewer interface that I was just showing you. 
Uh, you can also allow or not allow people from a mobile device to view the camera. Sometimes you want people to be able to just hit the IP on the camera from their from a mobile network and view the camera on their tablet or whatnot, and you can have that ability here. You can also add multiple users. Uh, multiple users are nice, so you can see who did what in logs, but you can also set what they can do. So you have three basic statuses, administrator, operator, viewer. Uh, administrator can do everything. Operator can view it, make some PTZ moves, uh, and those type of things, the, and view logs and things. The, the viewer uh, can only view the front, thing, front of the interface, and we can control what the viewer can do with these privileges up here in terms of pan, tilt, zoom control, and that sort of thing. Uh, you can actually uh, use certificates. Um, so right now it's a self-signed certificate, but you can also create a certificate request and then install a certificate from a certificate authority. And uh, you can also enable HTTPS. Right now I access the camera via only HTTP. You could actually manage the camera via HTTPS and use a signed certificate so you don't get the certificate error when you hit it for the first time. And more importantly, when you hit it for the first time, you don't have to go through all that. The issue that you had with Internet Explorer uh, allowing uh, an unsigned certificate. Access list is very important. Uh, you're able to actually list what IPs are allowed to access this camera. Uh, the reason why this is important is maybe you want only your video management system to access the camera. Maybe you don't want just any computer to access the camera. Uh, or maybe you want an operator and the video management system. So you can add those in here to, to provide that ability. You can also set how many people connect to the camera. Um, it's set at its max right now, which is 10. And you can also view um, who is actually connected to the camera. Um, and there you go. So you can also filter. Uh, you, if you enable this, then you can filter out what IPs can access it or not. You can also, just for fail safe, always allow a particular IP to access the camera just to make sure you don't get blocked out of the camera interface. If you, if you have 802.1x authentication in your network, you can enable that box, and then you can set your uh, EAP method in here. Uh, I always use this, and then you can set your uh, private key password and your certificate and all that kind of things. Uh, so if you use 802.1x uh, authentication, uh, the camera does support that feature. Under network, you have your general settings. Right now it's getting an IP address automatically. You can have it use a fixed IP address, which is what you always do. You can also have it obtain an IP address via PPBOE. Not very common in North America anymore. Uh, and you can also have it use an IP version six. So let's say you're on Hurricane Electric or you actually had an IP version six uh, network. You could then um, have it use uh, IP version six and you can manually specify an IPv6 address or you can have it automatically obtain an IP address uh, for IPv6. Here's where you can set your ports for HTTPS, your audio ports and your FTP port if you needed to change those to go through a firewall or some of the reason like that. Under streaming protocols, so it does do HTTP streaming. Very important, most people don't know where to find these, but here they are. If you wanted to go and get a URL, if you wanted a URL to the camera, just so you can see the video stream, here are the four video streams. So you type HTTP colon slash slash, the IP address of the camera followed by the name of that stream and you'll see that stream constantly coming from the camera. You can also use a program like VLC. So uh, with VLC, uh, if you open that up, you can you can open a network stream and you can type in the uh, streaming IP, IP address followed by the path that you see uh, here and you'll actually see that stream coming come that way. Uh, you can also do RTSP streams, so not just HTTP, you can do RTSP. VLC, which I was just showing you, also does that. And so here is the stream names for RTSP feeds. And here's your RTP ports. RTP is very common uh, for you know specialized video servers or whatnot that grab RTSP feeds. And so you can do that with VLC. It also grabs the audio stream too, which you maybe most people don't recognize, but it grabs the video and the audio. Um, which is nice. So you can actually stream the video and the audio coming from the camera. And that's where you set those settings up. Okay, QoS. You can enable uh, classes of service. You can also enable quality of service. Both of these are features that can be enabled. Uh, notice you can specify the VLAN ID. Uh, and on QoS, you can specify um, 
it, it automatically recognizes uh, QoS settings. So you can um, program that in there and you can give it your Q, your values here uh, so that when you configure QoS, you can specify the values that you want to uh, prioritize. On dynamic DNS, if you happen to have this camera plugged into a DSL line and you wanted it to, and it was using an automatic IP address, and you wanted to automatically register its uh, obtained IP address with a dynamic DNS provider, you can do that. However, it only supports no IP.com and change IP.com are the two dynamic DNS providers that it supports. It does support uh, SNMP. If you enable SNMP, uh, it does give the ability to set your uh, whether it's public or private, it does provide you with the ability to set passwords and all that kind of thing uh, for SNMP version 3, which supports that. And uh, here's where you can set your private and your public, uh, SN you can set your string name, right? The default string name is set to private, but you can change that to whatever you want it to for SNMP. Audio and video. Okay, for image, this is probably the most important part. Here's where you can timestamp the uh, image. Most people don't like to do this, but you can timestamp it. You can also put a title in it. Like maybe you wanted to say, this is the camera in the, so if I, if I check this and I say, uh, lab camera, and now I click save, and then I go back to the home page, um, embedded at the top here, you'll see, you can't see it very well because I've got it shrunk down. If I go to 100%, you'll see lab camera, and then it's got the date and time. Okay, uh, let's go back up, back to uh, audio and video, and we'll go to image. Another thing that's kind of important is the ability to flip the video. So what I'm going to do is, that before we do that, I'm going to go back here to the home, and I'm going to uh, go back over here to the camera, and I'm going to adjust this camera, and I'm going to move the camera down so you can see me. Hello, everybody. Now you can see me. The camera is focusing on me. So you can see me, but the problem is I'm upside down. So uh, it, now the reason why it's upside down, because most of the time we like to install these cameras uh, on the ceiling or on the wall. Uh, we don't normally install them on a desk <laughs> like this. So, uh, but if, what, if you install it that way, you can always go to configuration, audio and video, image, and you can adjust it by flipping the video configuration. This way it'll flip it upside down. So let's go ahead and save that. And I'm gonna click okay, and we'll go back to home. And you'll see what that setting looks like. Now I'm 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 correct, right? Hello. So I'm on the right side. I'm right side up now. So if I go back to configuration, audio, video, image. Now uh, a couple other settings. You can mirror it, so you can mirror the image. So if you wanted to look at me sitting the other way, uh, we'll um, we'll look at what that looks like. Now I, you're looking at me backwards, right? I'm a mirror image. Sometimes if you have the camera looking at a signage and you want it to display the signage, not reversed, but uh, in the in, in left to right, then sometimes you need to flip the mirroring, which is what this feature is for. So you can see that there, pretty nice, huh? So now I'm, I'm backwards. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to configuration, back to audio video, and we'll go to image. All right, uh, you also can set it to just pure black and white. Some situations may call for black and white. You don't need to worry about nighttime viewing. It'll automatically adjust for uh, black and white settings for nighttime viewing. And it has an IR cut filter already built into it. So you don't need to worry about this setting, but sometimes people like their cameras to be always black and white. Maybe uh, it's a very specialized usage. Maybe we're using the camera for analytics or something that where black and white is all we need. And so you could set it to black and white. I'll save that and we'll go back to home. And we'll just take a look at what that looks like. All right, I am black and white. Cool. So you can do that. So we'll go back. I like a color world. So we're going to go ahead and set it back to color. All right, back to color. Now, power line frequency. Don't ever change this if you're in North America. If you're outside of the country, sometimes you need to set it to 50 hertz. Um, you'll know you need to set the power line frequency differently if you get this uh, flicker in the video as you're watching it. Um, and so if you get that kind of flicker, then maybe uh, setting the power line frequency would help it. Under day-night settings, here's where you can um, have it automatically switch to black and white uh, in night mode. Uh, you can also disable the IR LEDs. Maybe you don't want these IR LEDs that are on the camera now uh, triggering on at night, so you can disable those. And right now the uh, IR cut filter is automatic, automatic, so it'll automatically um, cut out the IR uh, 
uh, allow for the IR uh, day night mode. You can do that. Um, IR cut filters are important because um, you you want to make sure that the 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 God, why can't I remember the word? Sensor uh, is is pro, is being able to detect which type of light you need for that particular environment. So if I'm at night and I've got IR on, I want the sensor to be grabbing that. Um, so I have to have the IR cut filter. So you can also choose. Oops, you can also choose the uh, light sensitivity. Um, if you've got a very very bright light source nearby, you may want to adjust this. So maybe I can set my light sensitivity to low. Um, um, let's see. Let's see if that actually helps me at all. Um, if I go back here to home, you see those lights behind me. Uh, it's kind of grabbing those lights behind me. I don't know if they'll make any difference or not. Let's go look. Um, I'll uh, I'll see. The, the 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 thing that would have the most effect on this would be white balance features. But let's go ahead and see if this does anything for me. If the I'll set it to really high. Let's see. Let's see if this makes any difference at all. I I don't think it will. But we'll we'll play with it. It doesn't really make that much of a difference, but you have a light sensitivity. I I haven't found a need to adjust that setting that often. So we'll just leave it at medium. There we go. All right, so here's where you set or disable the IR cut filter. Most people leave it at auto. Sometimes you don't want the IR cut filter um, doing that. Uh, the reason why is because as it gets nighttime, the IR cut filter may cut in and cut out, um, especially if maybe... There's something causing it to get dark suddenly or quick, you know, a shadow passing. This can cause issues. Sometimes people will actually have it schedule. Maybe I want it to all IR cut filter to be on at a certain time. This way I have no danger of the IR cut filter clicking in uh, at random times once it gets to a certain state at night. I can instead have the IR cut filter only come in at a particular time. So that might be why you would do that. Okay? Let's go uh, to a couple other settings. All right, preferences. Here's your white balance features. Pretty important feature. Uh, the reason why it's, right now, white balance is auto. And the reason why white balance is a big issue is because um, different colors uh, have different temperatures. And when they come into the, the sensor, they can be perceived in a certain way. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you look through a camera at a, you know, as the sun's going down, you'll notice the shadows are kind of a lighter blue, whereas maybe the the direct sunlight is more a brighter color, like a yellow or something. It is because temperature has different color, so uh, or uh, color has different temperature. So you can actually adjust if you have a situation where maybe whites don't look quite so white. Maybe they look a little bit more blue or a little bit more yellow or whatever case because of the temperature scenario, then maybe you can adjust this. So the way you, you, you can adjust the gain up or down, um, notice that right now, you're seeing the effect right now. My monitor uh, here on the screen, is it's got a tinge of blue to it. I, 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 at least I think that my monitor right now is actually white. Um, so the, it's picking this up different now. Different light sources are going to produce a different effect. In fact, you're seeing another artifact up here on the wall. Do you see the, you see this light up here? The fluorescent lights are up here. They're casting kind of a blue shadow up here. Do you see that? In reality, I'm looking at this, and that is not blue at all. That that's actually kind of a brown color, and you're seeing it as kind of a blue color. So the camera is not getting uh, reality here because it's picking up. Uh, the temperature of that color and it's reflecting it as a blue color so we can actually adjust the the um, red and blue uh, to balance out the white color so I don't know we can mess around with this so I'll knock this down to 5% right let's, let's see what that does oh wow look at that so by by adjusting the the B of the RGB spectrum uh, now, now the fluorescent lights are, are it's really, um, you're getting this yellow, kind of warmer, higher temperature uh, uh, reading uh, from the light source. And so, but notice, uh, notice, even though I totally jacked up the rest of the room, notice that the monitor is looking more white, right? So you got trade-offs here. So we can start to adjust. Let's, let's get, let's go 25%, see what happens here. Ah, no, slight improvement, right? It's not yellow like it was. Notice my monitor's looking a little bit more white, 
And notice I have less of that blue artifact up here, right? So I'm actually able to um, make whites more actually white uh, by doing that. Now, um, notice up here, I'm going to just mess around just so you can see the effect. So I'm going to move the red down to 5%. Notice I'm starting to get kind of this green hue, uh, uh, you know. And if you really want to understand this, go just Google temperature and color and you can see the spectrum of colors and kind of get an understanding. But this is really helpful when you get fluorescent lightings, artificial lights, sunlight, whatever that's washing out your image and causing your color sources to be whacked out. You can actually adjust this with this gain right here as you just saw me do right here as we were experimenting with it. You can also adjust the brightness of your image. So let's say I, you wanted to increase that. So I'll, I'll go up to a level of six there and we'll see what that looks like. Notice the image is brighter. Uh, sometimes that helps, especially when you're looking into uh, a well-lit area that's got a darker background. You may want to adjust the brightness. So you can adjust that. I'm going to go back down to zero and let's go ahead and change the, we'll, we'll increase the contrast so you can see the effect of that. Notice that you're increasing the contrast. The, what contrast has done is notice that there's more detail in the areas that were um, kind of being washed out by the light before. And so you can kind of play with that. And then you might want to adjust the sharpness. Uh, maybe the, it's, it's a little too sharp now. So you can adjust that. And so the lines of resolution will become a little bit more blurred. And so you can adjust that as you, as you wish. So these are very helpful settings to help make your image better. No condition is ever going to be the same. So notice here the contrast. Uh, notice there's not as high contrast. It's a, little, it's a little blurry in areas, but maybe blurry is actually good. Maybe it's, it's, it's helped uh, clarify certain things. So you can kind of play with that. Um, so there you go. Uh, you can just leave that however you want to leave that. Now, um, notice it's got this low light compensation. You can have the actually ha actually have the camera compensate for low light. Uh, kind of, a, it, we it's almost like it's grabbing light. It's using whatever light source it has to to um, improve the image where it would be dark. You may not want this in a well lit area. So if you're in a well lit area like I am now, I may want to remove that. Um, and uh, you know, you may want to, and, and you can just experiment. This absolutely did nothing in this condition, but you might want it to compensate, especially if you're in a low light environment. They leave that checked just so that you can, uh, most people do put cameras outside, so they want that ability. Now, here's the great feature, and this is included in the camera. Uh, there's a lot of cameras in the market that started to have wide dynamic range. It has wide dynamic range, and believe me, this camera with wide dynamic range enabled can look at a very low light situation and it can almost be as if that uh, was uh, looking like daylight. Uh, it's really rather amazing. Uh, the camera has this ability. It can, it can get down to a very, very uh, low light setting even with IR disabled. So you can disable the IR and you'll get this. Now what's nice about it is with WDR enhanced on, in a low light condition, you'll still get a color image as long as the IR cut filters off and as long as IR is not working. You'll still get a cut. You'll get a color image um, uh, even with this feature enabled. So uh, wide dynamic range is something to experiment with. It really helps with really shiny objects. Uh, uh, it really helps with um, backlit environments. So, so if there was a window behind me that was really bright, uh, this, it could really help reduce that glare and actually see what's behind you better. So you have all those features and you can really, you can mess with this. Uh, it's better to mess with this when you're in a very well lit area with a lot of backlight and you can experiment. But that that's with wide dynamic range enabled. I'm going to disable it for now and we'll move on. Exposure. Exposure allows us to adjust where the sensor will, what light source or what area of light source that the camera will use for its exposure. Right now, the full view is working for the exposure of the image and you can actually customize this. So um, I'm going to add an inclusive, uh, an exclusive window. And the reason I wanna show you this is I can drag this up here and maybe I want to exclude the lights up here, right? I wanna exclude these as being that, um, 
exclude them from my exposure. So I'm going to, in fact, I'm just going to drag that whole thing up there. I'm going to exclude all those lights up there as my thing. So, right, I'm, I'm, I got that set. Now I'm going to click Save. All right, so now I've excluded those lights um, in the in the uh, window. Just to show you, uh, that that's what that would do. You can also say I want to include. So I want the exposure to be maybe uh, another area. Like this is the area I want to include. So I can maybe say this dark area back here. Now sometimes this will produce different effects. So let's see what that effect produces. So this is saying, okay, I'm going to include this area in my uh, uh, exposure settings. Oh, I'm sorry, it's really not doing much because my exposure, you, you know, and you can see what exposure level you want to set. Let me do this. Yeah, there you go. Now see, because I set the um, include to be that darker source right back there, and, and notice that it's really exposing the image because it's really trying to grab in light from that. And notice, I don't know if you can tell, but you can actually see back in there a little bit better than you could before. Um, let's go ahead and get rid of that and let's add an exclusive window. And let's go up here and do that same trick we did before. All right, the reason I wanted you to show that is, is look what's happening now. Notice, I can almost see the details of that fluorescent light right now. Um, and so you can kind of see the details there. You can also adjust the gain, um, especially the wide dynamic range on. You can adjust this gain. And um, boy, I'm telling you, it can really, you can adjust this gain and really affect kind of how it perceives that image. So you can have a lot of fun playing with that. Um, those kind of settings. So anyway, here's your gain values, your exposure values. You also have automatic, so you can do indoor, outdoor, and just kind of, bait, just I don't know what exact levels it sets, but you can experiment with that. So, there, so setting everything back to default, there's my indoor, and now here's my outdoor settings. So, you know, outdoor uh, obviously has a, um, uh, a different exposure level. I think it probably has a, a lot lower exposure level because it's used to being a very bright, you know, ambient light everywhere outside. Whereas indoors, there's usually one or two light sources. So indoors probably, um, you'll probably, it'll probably be more. Yeah, so you can see the difference there. So definitely you want to experiment. Now keep in mind that cameras don't, lighting conditions aren't always the same during the entire course of the day. So you'll have to test at various times to get a good balance. Um, but anyway, there you go. You can also set up profiles, by the way. So you can have different profiles for different settings, which this is a great feature. Notice how I was just adjusting. Well, how am I to know it's going to stay the same? Like let's say I leave this office and I turn the lights out. Well, obviously I'm going to have a different exposure settings when I'm in here as opposed to when I'm out of here. So I can have set up different profiles. I can have a profile for uh, I can have a profile for indoors and I can have a profile a profile with the lights off, profile that out. So I can apply it to day mode, night mode, or scheduled time. So let's say after 10 o'clock, I want this camera to now be viewing uh, different exposure than it is when it is during the day uh, when I'm here, right? Or maybe the weekends or, or whatever the case may be. So you have lots of different profiles. The profile setting here is a pretty neat feature. Focus and zoom. All right. Here's where you can zoom in. Now here's where I can say, you know what? I don't need this entire full HD view of this camera. I only need, you know, maybe, and notice it's zooming, it's, uh, it's zooming in automatically for me. See that?
So I'm not touching the camera. I'm doing this all automatically through controls. And, and, and now I want to focus it. Here's where I can automatically manual focus the camera however I want to. There we go, getting a little better focus. Oh, a little too far. Notice how it's kind of hard to adjust. Well, let's say I get it pretty good, right? But I haven't quite got there. I now have this one touch focus where it can actually auto focus, which is what it's trying to do right now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look at all the different settings and go back. So it's actually auto focusing. Um, by the way, uh, I didn't do it quite right. It's a good idea to, yeah, so it's a good idea to start at one end or the other. But notice it, it, it did a pretty good job. It auto-focused itself. So this is the auto-focus feature. What's really nice about it is you don't have to have your technician up on a ladder focusing the camera. You can have it automatically do a focus. Uh, so you don't really need to focus the camera. Just get it up in the wall, get it viewing what you want, and then have it do the automatic focus, which is kind of cool. Now you can actually, another thing is, you can set a focus window. This is another big deal, right? Because right now, who knows what it focused on, right? It just focused in general. But let's say it was really important not to focus on me, but maybe to focus on something up here, right? Like maybe the focus really needed to be what was going on behind me, not not uh, not not me. So in that case, I'm setting the focus window. Now I can do my focus. And instead of focusing on me, it's going to focus on what's behind me instead. Boy, that didn't work out too good. <laughs> but you get the idea. Uh, you can uh, change the focus window. And I might want to do a full range scan on that. See, uh, on distant objects like that, the camera has a little harder ability to do the focus. If that doesn't work, we'll try something different. But notice it's focusing, uh, it's using that focus window to focus the image. Let's see if it does better on a full range scan. And the only problem with the full range scan is you actually have to wait for it to go through the full range scan, which uh, is annoying. So let's 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 let it crunch away here as it's focusing. So anyway, that's how you do it. So what's really nice about this is this is a great feature for auto focusing uh, after your cameras are up and installed and IPs are going, and you're back on your laptop or back on a computer station. You can simply focus the cameras manually and get them tweaked just nice. What's even better about this is oftentimes cameras will come out of focus for one reason or another and you can go in here and auto focus these automatically. So notice that our focus settings here didn't work all that well. It's probably having a difficult time and I think I actually bumped the uh, yeah I bumped the camera as we were talking. But notice that didn't work so well. Now if I were to focus it on me Now, uh, now notice it really does a good job because it's a near, it's a closer object. And so I'm a closer object. The focus is probably going to work much better because I'm an, I'm a close object. It'll focus on me. I'll stay still. Yeah, there, it did a much better job because I'm a closer object. So this way you can focus on what you're doing like let's say you're looking at a cash register or something you don't want to focus in on the periphery you want to focus in on the cash register transaction so that's how you do that focus feature um, very good uh, let's look at privacy mask privacy mask this is very pertinent for right now why because I may not want you looking at my emails I'm doing this video right so in this case I'm going to enable it I'm going to create a new video I'm going to call it computer Right, so um, I'm going to move this over here, and I'm going to privacy mask out my computer. Okay, I don't want you seeing my, so I'm going to save that. Now I've, I've privacy masked that out, right? So now if I go back up to my main image, guess what? 
you can't see my computer. You can't see what's on my desktop right now, and you can't even see my hand. See, no hand, hand, no hand. Now, what's even important is this is not part of the image anymore. This has been masked out. So even if it goes to the video management system, the video management system doesn't get to see this either. So uh, that's what privacy masks do. And now I've blocked out my monitor so you can't read my email. Okay, so there we go. I'm going back to the configuration settings, back to audio video. Let's go to uh, uh, image. And that's our privacy mask. I'm going to go ahead and remove the privacy mask. I really have nothing to hide. Uh, but I wanted, you to, I wanted you to see what that was like. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and remove privacy masking altogether. But that's how you set a privacy mask. Privacy masks are important. Maybe you don't want, you're viewing an outdoor element, you're looking at somebody's house. Maybe it's not appropriate for you to be viewing that, so you can block it out. Maybe you're viewing people's workstations and you don't want to see what's on their monitor. Uh, all different reasons like that. Let's go to stream. Here's where you can enable uh, 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 different video streams. So uh, in this case, there's four. And so you can change um, the, the format. So maybe I want to go all the way down to, you know, one SIF or Q SIF or whatever that is, quarter SIF. So I can go all the way down. Uh, let, I want to do that for, let's say, stream three. So I go, I want to drop that all the way down to very low re resolution. And I don't want it to be, I want it to be just, you know, this right here. So notice this is a quarter SIF. So I'm just, actually, that's really small. Ouch. Let's, let's do, um, uh, f uh, let's do four SIF, which is NTSC. Let's say I want a four SIF image of just me, right? So there you go. Now stream three is just viewing me at, at uh, NTSC output and at that 704 by 8, 480 resolution, right? So I'm gonna save that, click close. So now that we've done that, I'm gonna click save. I'm gonna go to home. Now I'm on video stream one, right? So now I'm gonna go to video stream three and now you're viewing just me. Right and for SIF instead of full HD. So, but what I want you to realize is there are actually two streams coming out right now: one in full HD and one in for SIF, which is what you're seeing right now. So that just gives you an idea of how powerful this is. You can have multiple streams coming out. And what really I want you to notice is how easy this was to do. This was not complicated, right? I have to fiddle around with it a bit, but it's not that hard, right? Okay, so that's how you enable uh, different streams at different settings. And you have four video streams that you can do. Audio, okay. I'm gonna mute my auto settings. This way I don't want any audio, or you can leave the audio on. I mean, I do want audio. Now, what's really powerful about this is uh, you can have in, an internal microphone. You can also have an external microphone. So the camera has an internal microphone built into it. It also has an external microphone port. If you remember, on the back of the camera was that uh, audio in uh, port back there. And then um, what, notice that you have full settings over the AAC bitrate. Now, Toshiba is one of the few cameras that I found uh, in the security world that actually have a pretty nice uh, AAC bitrate on the camera. It's not like 8-bit mono, which is what a lot of the cameras are. So you do have really a lot of audio settings here, which makes this really nice uh, in terms of grabbing audio. <clears throat> so if you've got an environment sensitive to both video and audio, this Toshiba camera is a great selection for you. PTZ. We don't have a lot of PTZ settings because it's all digital. Because obviously right now we only have digital settings. Um, I'm going to go to my stream one here, my full HD stream. And notice we can set the uh, digital pan tilt zoom features and we can zoom in and these are these are obviously zooming in digitally right they're not um, doing that now because this 10 this uh, full HD camera is a wide view I can actually create uh, patrols where it'll zoom in on different areas of the view and I can do that at different uh, different times so um, let me let me show you. Um, let's say I wanted to view the door behind me, right? So I'm going to zoom in. There, I'm viewing the door, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and add that now as a 
preset door. There, now I have door, right? And I'm gonna, there you go. And now let's say I wanted to have, we'll go back home. Let's say I wanted computer. So let's say I wanted my next one to be computer. I'm gonna add that preset. So now I've got door and I've got computer. Okay, and I'm gonna add them, but now I can even have this thing automatically patrol uh, through the, the automatically patrol between the different views, right? Now, uh, let's, let's do this real quick. Let me, let me, let me add a, another one. I'm gonna call this one home. I'll call it main. So I've got one called main. Okay, so I'm adding main. Let's let's take it a minute to add there. Ah, it died on me. Let's hope. Let, no, it worked. I didn't want to have to reboot. All right, there we go. So uh, I got door, computer, main. Right. So I've got all three of those patrol locations. But what I want to show you is I can go here and I can go door. I want to go to door. Notice how it's pan tilt. It's zooming in digitally, but it's zooming in on door. Okay, now I want to go to computer. So I'm going to flip here and go to computer. And now it's going to zoom over to computer, right? Do you see that? Pretty neat. So here's my patrol locations. I can actually have it uh, automatically uh, patrol. Uh, so it'll automatically go um, in a patrol, automatically going in between those different views. Okay. So there you go. Now I don't know if the patrol actually works automatically in the front view. Let's let's let let's see here. Let's let's go to the home view. So I'm viewed on computer. And I'm going to click patrol. All right, so let's see what happens. I'm on my patrol. Let's see if it follows my patrols accurately. All right, so the first patrol should be the door. All right, looks like it's going to the door. Woohoo! It did the door. Awesome. Now it should go to the computer uh, after five seconds. It does. It's going to the computer after five seconds. There you go. Awesome. And then after five more seconds, it should zoom out and go to my main view. There we go. All right, it worked. That's nice. That's that's nice. Now it's going to continue. It's going to keep repeating. All right. So let's go back to configuration, uh, and let's go back to audio video, and we'll go back to our streams. Or no, was it? Uh, uh, no, we are on PTZ. That's right. So PTZ settings, and here we are on. It's doing my little thing. So I'm going to go ahead and remove those out of there because I don't want it to actually be doing that patrol craziness right now. All right, so we're gonna go back home. All right, there we go. So that's how you do your PTZ controls in the camera. All right, now events. Events are pretty powerful. Um, so the camera can have, things can trigger the camera and then the camera can do things. So before we set up an event, we first have to go to an event server. So we can call this my mail server. And here where we can put in uh, um, Toshiba, right? And then I can say who I want it to send to. I want this to send to me, right? Now you can specify your, your server address. And you can, if you if it requires an authentication, you can put in the username and the password, um, or you can enable relay on that mail server so it'll allow you to do that. And and so you can have it send an email. So I can set up a mail server like that, right? Notice I've set up a mail server. You can also uh, you can also add you can do have it do FTP. So I can set up an FTP server or via port 80 
Um, or you can have it go to a network storage, like maybe um, my my server backslash backslash my server slash video, and uh, this could and I could type in uh, admin. Right, so this will actually connect to the admin server. Oh, my server. So this will actually save right to, uh, if you have direct ne a network attached storage unit, it can actually save to a network attached storage. You can also set up uh, event media. So, um, so I can set up media, I want snapshots to be saved. And so I can have the snapshots come from stream one, two, three, or four. Maybe I want the snapshots to come. We'll call this snap of guy. So if I want those snapshots of four sif of me, I could say stream four, and I could have a, a name, the prefix guy dash, and then I want the date and timestamp. So basically, I, I can create a media that'll, that'll create snaps of me uh, every so often with that prefix guy and the date and name to it. So I can save that, right? You can also have do video clips. So that those are snapshots. You can also have it do video clips. Um, you can have it do video clips, just like, just, and you do the same way. Or you can have it do uh, just the log file. So maybe I want it to be just log. So I'll say log. All right, there you go. Now I can add an event. So here you go. So we're gonna call this an event. So I can now enable this event. I can set the priority. I have three levels of priority. And I can say, um, uh, I can adjust the motion. Because if you have an event triggered on a motion, motion meaning movement, sometimes you don't want the same movement causing 50 alerts. So I can say, you know what, don't do another um, event on motion, let's say until after 60 seconds or maybe after 300 seconds or, because I don't want to keep getting alerts on motion on this camera all the time. If, Like for example, I have this camera here at night, let's say, and I want it to watch motion, but I don't want, um, when the cleaners come in, I don't want it sending me 50,000 images of the cleaners cleaning the floor. So instead, I, I would maybe do, you know, maybe every five minutes or whatever. So that's how you do that. So you can do that. Schedule. I want. To, when do I want it to do? Always. Not during the day, because then it'll be triggered on me moving around. So let's do it. You know, maybe at. at you know, maybe maybe during it. You know, a certain time during the night, I want it to happen. Right. You can also do a trigger. So I can say, you know what, when motion occurs. So when motion occurs. Uh, I want it to do this. Now, obviously, you have to set up the motion detection parameters, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a minute on motion detection parameters. You can do that, or you can have it just periodically every five minutes. So every five minutes, I want an image um, or whatnot. You can have it, you know, if on the back of the camera, on the back of the camera, there's these inputs. Um, there's little uh, pins here. You can have one of the, a digital input, maybe from an alarm system, or maybe from a door contact. So maybe if somebody opens the door, you want that to come in to the camera. Uh, you can have that. If the camera reboots, you can have it be a trigger. Uh, if something gets recorded, so somebody records something on the front page, you want that to do that. Uh, if somebody holds their hand in front of the camera for a period of time and blocks the camera view uh, for more than a certain time, then you can have it trigger, or you can have it manually triggered, um, and you can set up manual triggers, and those are available on the front page when you view the, the, the solution. So then you can have an action occur. And so I can say, you know what? When the trigger occurs, I want it to trigger the digital output. Now the digital output, once again, is on the back of the camera. So there's two pins on here are the digital output. So if the trigger launches, I want it to launch this digital output on the back of the camera and cause that to fire. Um, if the, I can also have it um, back up, if, if it's unable to connect to the network, such as your NAS box or your uh, FTP or HTTP server, I can have it automatically saved to the SD card. And if you had an SD card um, on your, inside the camera, 
then you could have it go to the SD card. And I can say what media. I want it to be snapshots, not not video or whatnot. And you can have it go to a mail server or to your, your this is my um, NAS box. So you can do that. And I can create folders based on time and date and, and that sort of thing. So that, that's basically how you do it. So you have it scheduled on when you want it to occur, what causes the trigger, and then what you want it to do. So th that's how you do events. Events are pretty powerful. Pretty neat way to integrate your camera system with what's going on in your environment. All right, applications. Here's where you set up your uh, motion. Just remember that trigger required motion. So we can enable motion detection. So now if it sees motion, now it's going to trigger. Or I can say, you know what? Only uh, do I want it to trigger when uh, door movement, door. I'll just call it door. So only when something moves behind me, right? Only when something walks through that door do I want it to trigger. So this is my motion trigger, and I can make it sensitive or, or not sensitive, how sensitive I can make it, and what percentage of motion, what percentage of this little window needs to see motion for it to trigger. Usually you want this pretty low, maybe 25%, and maybe I want it to be, you know, maybe so sensitive, and I can save that. By the way, you can also do motion windows based on profile. So you can have different motion windows on day, night, uh, on a schedule just like before really powerful feature there but now that now that I've set up a, uh, a motion trigger on that door behind me I can now go back up to event and I can create an event right and on this event notice on the trigger I can say video motion and then I can say yeah I want it to be the door motion so when the door motion fires I want uh, I want an action to take place like let's say take a picture so perfect case study. Let's just do it right now. I'm right here. Notice I've got a door right there. My uh, my um, but the front door to my to my lab here. So looking at the front door to my lab. Let's say I have a camera in here, and when somebody opens that door, maybe at night or during the day, trying to steal some of my equipment, I want to know when that's going to occur. So if that door opens and I see motion there. Um, then I want to know that happens, trigger it, send me uh, an email, a log, send it to a file, a server, whatever. Probably I want to get it over email, right? So that's probably what I want to do is get it over email so I, I know that it occurred, right? And I get it on my camera phone and I can see, see that, that that happened, all right? So those are pretty powerful features, I think. So, uh, all right, that's motion detection. Digital input and digital output. So on the back of the camera, you have digital in and digital out. As you notice, you can do triggers that cause digital in or digital out to occur. I already talked about that. Um, digital in would come from a door contact. So when the door opens, the door contact would would uh, would um, uh, send voltage or not voltage or open or close the relay. Um, out, you can have it trigger an alarm system or something. So you can have it uh, uh, be set to closed or open. So right now you can say what the default state is. Right now it's grounded, meaning it's a closed circuit. Or open, meaning it's an open circuit. So right now it's an open circuit. So uh, I could say, you know what, when this becomes uh, uh, when this becomes open or when this becomes closed, then the alarm system would trigger knowing that something happened. So you can do digital and digital output. Now what's very good about this, let's say I had a very highly protective secret room that nobody could get into. I don't want anybody in there for any reason. And if they're in there, I want the alarm to go off. So I put the camera up there. I set my trigger, my, my event. So I set my event to, um, I go to my event settings. I add my adding my event. If somebody comes in this room, then I want uh, it's if, if video motion occurs anywhere by that door, for example, then I want absolutely to trigger the digital output. So when somebody comes into that room, trigger the digital output. That'll open or close those wires, and it'll fire off the alarm system. And so that's that's how you take care of the, that kind of integration. Pretty powerful feature. So that's digital in and digital out, tampering. So if somebody holds their hand over the camera or is up here trying to mess with it or spray paints it, you know, whatever, messing with the camera, uh, you can say, you know what, if that, la um, if, if that 
tampering lasts for five seconds, that I am going to, uh, that could be an alert. Actually, it can only go as low as 10, I'm sorry. There you go. So if it gets obstructed or blocked or whatever for more than 10 seconds, then that can consider a tampering uh, alert. Okay. Uh, so that, that's how that works. So then recording. So you can auto, automatically have this thing, um, guy record. I can have recordings automatically happen. Um, and I can record from different streams, let's say from my, my stream three that we set up the, the, just a minute ago, anytime during different times. Maybe, maybe I only want it to record when the network fails. And by the way, this is a powerful feature for things like you know compliancy, like maybe they have to have the video no matter what. So let's say the network goes down and I want that video. Maybe somebody cuts my network or network goes down or power outage. I still want that recorded video coming in Power outage isn't going to kill the camera because I have PoE switches, right? The PoE switches are on EPS. So the camera's still up and running and power's out. So on a network fail, um, actually that wouldn't work because the network wouldn't fail because it's on a PoE switch. Damn. Um, well, anyway, what? Uh, yeah. So somebody cuts the network wire. There you go. So I cut the network wire. Network wire, but that's going to screw me up because it's PoE. So if somebody cuts the network wire, PoE is going to go out. Ah, then I would need a... Uh, um, Voltage coming into the back of the camera, powering the camera without PoE. Ah, now if somebody cuts the camera, the camera's still powered, I can start recording locally. Woo, glad I figured that out. But nonetheless, you can do it on network fail or on a schedule. So let me only at night or only on the weekend. Uh, and then I can have it go to a destination. So I can have it destined to my server, right? Uh, and I can uh, set it up to where it doesn't overwhelm disk space. Or I can set it to go to the SD card on the camera. This way, I always have a backup of what was going on the camera. Maybe right before somebody decided to blow up the camera or whatnot, I could get that last few minutes of, of recording. So there you go. That's how you set up recordings. Finally, local storage. Here's where you can manage your SD card. And uh, you can see how much format's available. I don't have any. Too bad. Uh, and then you can see uh, content management. So I can... Uh, once you've done recording, you can now search your video from this interface, and I can search for um, you know different things on the camera. So, and you can view the the images when they've been stored. You can download them. You can convert them to API if they're just still motion. And so you can view all the camera records that have been stored on your chip and you can go in and view them and review them. So pretty neat, huh? I think it's pretty cool. So now we're back to the home page and you're looking at me, hopefully. There there I am, hello everybody. Uh, so um, I want to just say in conclusion that this is a really powerful camera. The only thing I haven't shown you, uh, and actually let's do that now. I am going to go to configuration and just to put a big exclamation point on how cool this camera is, I'm going to go to audio video to image. No, I'm not. I'm not going there. Yeah, there we are. Uh, I'm not going to disable the IR LED, and I'm going to leave the uh, to IR cut filter to auto. So I'm going to save that. So I'm going to aim this camera back at the door. There we go. And I'm going to walk over to the light. Yeah, walk to the light, guy. Walk to the light. So I'm going to turn the lights off. So here we are, and I'm going to walk over to the light switch. And here I go. I'm turning the light switch off, and we will see what happens. Does the camera able to... Oh, there goes the IR cut filter. It cuts on, and we're now getting an IR image. Hello. And notice how great that... See, did you notice what just happened here? This is a pretty important feature. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But notice the the IR cut filter is on right now. You, can you see the, the the spread pattern of the IR? Do you see it? It's like a circular. You, you, can you see it? It's the it's, it's really bright now. So if I walk over here, there's the I, there's the uh, you can see that's what the IR spectrum is. If I turn the light back on, lights are back out. IR cut filter. There goes the IR cut filter. We're back in color. Now, uh, what I want you to notice that when I did that the first time, I'm going to do another feature now where I'm going to disable that. 
So uh, where are we at? Okay, I'm going back to um, uh, audio video image and I'm going to go back to uh, day night settings. Now I'm going to disable the IR LEDs um, this time and um, Now I believe, uh, let's see, exposure. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, I want to enable, uh, I'm going to enable the, the wide dynamic range enhanced. I'm going to save that. All right, now the IR, the IR has been disabled. The infrared uh, illuminator has been disabled. So now I'm going to turn off the lights. There we go. Now what I want you to realize here, right, lights are off. This, I'm complete black right now. So I'm, I'm in complete blackness. My lab has no lights. The only light that you are getting right now are from the monitors and from a distant light from a gym behind me. So uh, notice that wide dynamic range uh, and also the ability of the camera to capture light and bring light in is, is actually illuminating this shot pretty well. In fact, um, in complete blackness, um, let's see, let me find, yeah, in complete blackness, like over here in the corner, notice this is over in the corner. It's complete black over here, but you're still able to see me pretty good. And this is without IR on. So this camera is doing really well in low light, uh, even with the IR illuminators not even on. So this just gives you a good demonstration of the light features of this camera. All right, so I'm concluding this discussion. Hopefully you've learned a lot. This is a pretty powerful camera. You know, it's about a $500 camera, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and that's a pretty good price for such a powerful camera. Thank you very much. And visit physicalsecurityu.com for more. Thank you.